that are blinks so that we can subtract them out later. And then we average all those events together. So here's the EEG, red ball shows up, an event marker appears every time the red ball shows up. Every time that event appears, we'll take the time, the, the electrical activity following that event, and we'll average them all together to get one uber kind of average of electrical activity coming from the brain locked in time to this person seeing a red ball. And we do this for hundreds of trials. And what this does is this eliminates all the background noise from other bodily or psychological processes and lets us look at the neural activity that is specific to that event. From that average activity, we can pull out a number of neural components that are associated with self-regulation. And I'm gonna talk about four of them that we look at in our research. The first one is called the, the feedback-related negativity, or FRN. It is known to be generated by that anterior cingulate cortex. So it is activity coming from the anterior cingulate cortex. And what it is, is it's the activity that immediately follows feedback. So you perform a task and you're given feedback that you were right or wrong, and that's at this time point zero. Time point zero here is when you receive feedback. And within a couple hundred milliseconds, your brain processes negative feedback differently than it processes positive feedback. So what this is, is this your brain is knowing that you messed up and it wants to fix it. So greater activity is generated by knowing you messed up. I need to change what I'm doing. I need to learn from this mistake. I need to change my expectations and, and, and do something differently to meet my goals. So you adjust your behavior. So maybe you thought you knew the strike zone. The umpire says, no, you were wrong. That was a strike when you thought it was a ball. Aha, I need to, I need to improve my knowledge of the strike zone. And maybe I need to adjust my behavior. His off-speed pitches break very late. If I see an off-speed pitch, don't swing at it because it's going to end up being a ball and he's trying to get me to chase it. Something like that in the baseball world. And, and this is evidenced by, you know, you, you learning, getting feedback that you made a mistake and trying to learn from it. Another component that follows feedback is this component called the FCP or frontal central positivity. So again, time point zero is when you got feedback. It follows in time this negativity. So the, the feedback related negativity is more like an alarm bell saying, you screwed up, you screwed up, fix it. The frontal central positivity reflects the amount of attention you're giving to that mistake. So it reflects the amount of attention you're giving to that feedback. And just to kind of orient you here on these graphs, negative polarity is up. So the feedback related negativity, the more negative it is, the bigger it is. The frontal central positivity, the more positive it is, the bigger it is. And this is our index, again, of your attention. So the more positive it is, the more attention you're giving to that feedback. And it's related to learning. You learn from your mistakes. You can't learn from them unless you pay attention to them. So you would associate greater learning with greater attention to the feedback. And, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So those are both components or neural activity tied to the feedback a, a baseball player would get from the umpire. But there's also neural activity associated with the actual pitch, the actual stimulus that the player is trying to respond to. And here we introduce a component called the N2. It's negative going. And here time point zero is the release of the pitch in our paradigm. At zero is when the pitcher lets go of the ball and within a couple hundred milliseconds, this component reaches its peak after that stimulus event. And what it, it's associated with is inhibiting responses or, or managing the conflict of different responses. So this happens every pitch for a baseball player because he has to determine, do I swing, do I not swing? Is it a ball or is it a strike? So this conflict is ever present. And here you can see this negative going component indexes that inhibition. So if there's more conflict going on, there's more, I need to answer strike and not answer ball, this would be more negative. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So these ball strike decisions, these swing take decisions that are existing every pitch are what a, a, a hitter has to battle with. And these the inhibiting what you don't want to do so that you can do what you want to do is reflected by this N2. And the final component I'll talk about is sometimes called the N450, but it's also called the medial frontal negativity. Lots of acronyms here in neuroscience. Um, this component, again, time locked, 
to the pitch or the event. It occurs a little bit later than the N2. Um, don't mind this graph, the polarity has been flipped. So this would be the N2 and here's the N450. We'll talk about this in a bit. But this reflects kind of ongoing conflict adaptation. So you have this conflict going on every time you see a pitch. Do I swing, do I not swing? And, and this component indexes kind of proactively trying to manage that conflict before it occurs. So this is kind of an online management of, okay, in, in preparation for the next pitch, I need to kind of be ready to manage this conflict and know what I want to do and how I want to do it. So for there, there's more of this proactive control happening when tasks are more difficult, say, when, than when they're easy. So we, we put people in a cap, in essence, and we measure their neural activity to get at these neural components while they're um, at the plate, so to speak. So what we did in our research is we had two groups of participants. We had college baseball players who you know, are experts at baseball, and experts at this task, Illinois Wesleyan baseball players. And then we just had psychology students that weren't college baseball players. So two groups of participants, kind of novices and experts. And what we had them do is we had them play the role of a hitter, making these ball strike decisions. So a pitch will come, you respond if it's a ball or a strike, you get feedback, next, next pitch comes. And while they're doing this kind of performance task of hitting buttons in front of a computer, we're measuring their neural activity the entire time. So the procedure, uh, we set them up in the, the cap that I showed you before. We had them sit quietly in front of a computer screen because physical movements can kind of interfere with our ability to measure neural activity. They were presented with pitch videos, 100, 200 pitch videos, which I'll show you in a second. After each, pit, after each pitch video was presented, they needed to, to answer whether that pitch was a ball or a strike. Then they would get feedback from you know, the umpire saying if they were right or wrong. And then the next pitch video would be presented and this would just continue. Every so often we gave them breaks so that they didn't go stir crazy and their eyes didn't cross and things like that. But it was just you know, pitch, response, feedback, next pitch. So here were their instructions. They had like a little response pad, a little controller held kind of quietly relaxed in their lap. If it was a ball, they hit a button with their left thumb. If it was a strike, they hit a button with their right thumb. And they, they had to respond while the pitch was in the air, just like they would have to do in real baseball, right? It was, it was a very fast paced task, which makes this actually extremely difficult. Uh, these pitches were purposefully put kind of on the border of the strike zone. Um, either in the strike zone for a strike, as you can see here, or outside of the strike zone for a ball, as you can see here, but they were close to the edges of the strike zone. And even at the major league levels, hitters, those, those pitches in that borderline are like 50-50. So this is a hard task. And we did that on purpose to ensure that there would be enough positive feedback and enough negative feedback to look at the neural activity. So here's a demonstration of actually what the, the paradigm looked like. What we did is we used a virtual reality software to kind of put the batter in the batter's box to record the pitches. We did not use, um, they could not have VR headsets on while they did the task because that interferes with the EEG, but we use VR software to, to save the, the stimuli, to save the pitches. So this is a right-handed batter in the right-handed batter's box seeing a right-handed pitcher throw pitches. And we had, you know, all the we had it for switch hitters. We had it for lefties versus lefties. We had all the combinations that you would see in baseball. At time point zero is when the pitch is released. Um, and so here it would be pitch. While the pitch is in the air, the player would hit a button to say ball or strike, and then they would get their feedback. And this is, it was pretty fast paced because we didn't want to wear them out, but this is what it looked like. If I can get the demo to play. Here we go. So you can see pitch, while the pitch is in the air, they hit a button, and then immediately after they get feedback. That was a ball, that was a strike. Pitch. Correct, that was a strike. Pitch, correct, that was a ball. While the pitch is coming, the player has to react just like he would in, in regular baseball. And every time they got feedback, whether they were correct or incorrect. And it was hard, so they would guess sometimes incorrectly. So they would get a, an ample amount of both types of feedback. And they saw different types of pitches, fastballs, change-ups, sliders, curveballs, much like they would do in real baseball to kind of make it a little bit more realistic. And it was from the view within the batter's box. Uh, previous research had done a view from behind home plate. 
but reviewers were like, well, that's more an umpiring task than it is a hitting task. So we used the software to put them in the batter's box. And again, this is a righty seeing a righty. And that would go on for like a block of 50 pitches and then we would give them a break and then we would do another block of 50 pitches and they would do a total of 200 pitches. And so this, as you can see here, is actual real neural activity. Each one of these lines represents a channel on the cap. So there were 64 channels, there's 64 lines here. And as you can see here, I'm gonna walk you through what we have. The first thing you'll notice are the blinks. So this person blinked right here and blinked right here. And you can see this massive kind of deflection and change in the electrical activity. And the reason why, again, is the muscle activity causing the blinks is outside the skull. So it's massive when you record it using these sensors. And it's even picked up by sensors in the cap. So we identify these blinks so that we can remove them because they don't reflect neural activity. But then if you notice at the bottom of the screen, we have these little markers. Also, just to kind of orient you, this solid line, these solid lines are exactly one second apart. So every one of these dotted lines is 200 milliseconds or a fifth of a second. So we're recording electrical activity continuously in real time. So you can see here at the bottom of the screen, this first thing is a, a pitch. So right at this marker is when the computer released the pitch and this pitch was thrown as a strike. We know it's a strike because we know we set up the pitches. We know exactly what's a strike and what's a ball. About 400 milliseconds later, it appears, the person responded. The person responded uh, with their left thumb, denoting they thought it was a ball. A sec, you know, half a second later, they get the feedback saying, nope, you were wrong. That's an error. It was a strike. So they get the feedback. Another second passes. The next pitch shows up. And this time it's a ball. And we even coded the balls to where they missed, high, low, inside, outside. Person responded that it's a ball. Correct, that was a ball. So every pitch they get that feedback. Here's the next pitch, it's another strike. The person responded, that's a strike. And the feedback says, yep, that's a strike. And then with each one of these time points, we can look at the neural activity after it, look at the neural activity after it, look at the neural activity after it. And then we can average those trials together to look at the, the kind of average neural activity when a player uh, is told that they screwed up versus when a player is told that they were correct. And then we can look at the average neural activity to the, the next pitch after they screw up or the next pitch after they didn't screw up and see if there are differences in the neural activity in real time during the task, which is much more objective than after the player gets back to the dugout saying, hey, what'd you see, what'd you think? Well, I thought, you know, this is, this is a much more objective measurement and that's what I'm trying to get at. So for the task itself, our little baseball task, thankfully players were better at it than non-players. That was kind of a little nervous. That would have been really bad if the, if the Psych 100 students were better at this than the baseball players. But the players were more accurate, uh, statistically so, more accurate. They also, uh, even though this is not significantly different, they responded a little bit more slowly than the novices, which actually makes sense because if you think about hitting a baseball, players have done this for years and years and years. They have a little bit, they're a little bit more efficient. They have a little bit more time before they have to make a decision because they can move their body more efficiently to hit a baseball. Whereas if you've never really played baseball before, you need to start getting your swing ready to go. So because they're experts, they have a little bit more time to see a pitch and judge it more closely. Um, but even again, this wasn't a statistically significant difference, but it's just kind of a curious little artifact. So then what we did talking about self-regulation, talking about learning, is we wanted to see how people performed after they were given feedback. So after you're told you just screwed up and you get error feedback here represented by these green bars, how accurate were you? And as you can see here, players had a, a massive kind of increase compared to non-players. After getting told that they were wrong on the previous pitch, they really improved their performance and their performance was great compared to the non-players. Additionally, players were more accurate overall, as we just talked about. They were also more accurate compared to non-players when uh, they were just given correct feedback. And this kind of group difference was significant. This difference was almost statistically significant, just looking at the players compared to themselves. So the players really here are showing this, this self-regulation, learning from their mistakes. When they're told that they messed up, 
they are much more accurate on the next trial, the next pitch in this case, than they are overall and then compared to the non-players. So this is really kind of behaviorally what you would hope and what you expect, and now we wanna figure out maybe why. So we looked at neural activity. So here we have the neural activity to the feedback. So here again, time point zero is when the umpire said, nope, you were wrong, or yep, you were correct. So we have the college players in green lines, the novices in the gray lines, and what do we find? What we find, again, with the, the feedback related negativity, the FRN here, that's kind of the alarm bell, and negative is larger. So there's a much larger alarm bell for novices compared to players. It's much more negative for the novices compared to players. Meanwhile, the frontal central positivity here, positive is larger, is bigger for players than it is for non-players. So the non-players, the novices have a, a much louder alarm going off, but the players have much more attention given to the feedback. And this makes sense in a number of ways. First of all, if you're an expert, you don't need a, a, a big alarm to kind of go off. So here's all that data in kind of a bar graph so you can see it better. Here, FRN, so negative is bigger. There's this huge alarm bell for the novices when they make a mistake. Like it's like a five alarm fire when they messed up. Whereas the, the players are just told like, yeah, I screwed up. They don't need as big an alarm to wake up the regulation and wake up the system. They don't need to be told and beaten over the head with how horrible they were. They can just get the signal and, and use the information. And you can see that here where the players show much more attention to the feedback, both negative and positive feedback compared to the novices, especially after they make a mistake, the novices are not paying any attention to the feedback. Why is that? because they're being deafened by the alarm. They're, they're, they're sh the, the alarm, of the, the feedback related negativity you screwed up is so loud and so kind of omnipresent and, and boisterous that they, they don't have any mental resources left to pay attention to the feedback. Whereas the players get a small alarm and pay a lot of attention to the feedback. The non-players get a huge alarm and have no attention to give to the feedback. And this might underlie why the players are doing better after errors and the non-players are not. Then we looked at the neural activity to the next pitch after feedback. So we looked at all the different feedback. So every time you got incorrect feedback, we grouped all those next pitches together and looked at your neural activity after you got negative feedback. And we looked at your neural activity after you got correct feedback and looked at all those trials together. And here, so time point zero is the next pitch release. And here we have the N2 and the medial frontal negativity. And we don't see a difference between the groups in the N2, which makes total sense because every pitch, everyone has to determine ball strike, ball strike, ball strike. So that, that conflict is always present. But what we do see is we see a huge difference for medial frontal negativity with, with the hitters showing way more kind of proactive control than the non-players. The players have this much greater level of proactive ongoing control to, to mitigate and, and navigate the task, whereas the non-players do not. So then we thought that was pretty cool. The hitters are showing all this neural activity and learning and self-regulation that the non-players aren't. So what we did is we looked at how does the neural activity relate with the task performance in the task. And, and bottom line is for the, for the players, all these measures of neural activity, all four of them that we talked about, FRN, FC, N2, et cetera, all of them related with at least one or two, most of them, at least two, but most of them, almost every measure of performance. This is reaction time. This is response accuracy or percent correct. This is post-error reaction time, post-error percent correct. Everything was related with the neural activity in the players. The non-players, there was almost no relationship between our measures of neural activity and their performance on the task, which suggests that the players are regulating the performance and, and, and learning and doing better, and the non-players just aren't. Also, we found relationships between the neural activity to the feedback and the neural activity to the stimuli, suggesting that the feedback matters. Hitting is not just a pitch at a time. 
you take the feedback, you learn from it, it affects what you do on the next pitch. And finally, we just looked recently, and this isn't even kind of done being analyzed yet, we found for the players that were in our task, we looked up their baseball stats, their actual on-field Illinois Wesleyan baseball stats for 2020 and their career. And we found a relationship between their neural activity to pitches in our little task, our little computerized thing that we just did, they were strongly correlated with their on-field performance, their batting average, their on-base percentage, their slugging percentage, their OPS, or on-base plus slugging percentage. Huge, strong correlations, meaning the greater, here negative correlations are a good thing because the greater or more negative the N2 and the greater or more negative the medial frontal negativity, the better or more positive the larger positive numbers they had with batting average on base percentage and slugging. So this little task and this neural activity from our little task was correlated with how they've done not only in 2020, which occurred right after we did the experiment, but with their career numbers as well. So this has been pretty interesting and kind of eye-opening um, and I'm continuing to pursue this because it's very rare that something from a lab translates to the real world. But what we found is that Feedback matters, neural activity matters. These are pretty objective measures of what's going on psychologically within a person. And you can't get at those measures by asking them after the fact or talking to them in the dugout. This is a better way to do it. So players showed correlations between their, their task performance and their adjustments in behavior. They were efficient learners that did not need this huge alarm to say, hey, you screwed up, hey, you screwed up. They got it with a small kind of reminder. So they were much more efficient and able to then pay attention to the feedback and learn from the feedback versus being you know, shocked and awed by the, the loud kind of feedback they were given that, oh, you screwed up. Players, again, greater attention, this attention to the feedback. And this was correlated not only with task performance in the, the computerized task, but it was correlated with kind of self-regulatory measures, post-error task performance and things like that. For the N2, that kind of inhibitory control mechanism, greater N2 for the players associated with greater response accuracy in the task. And also more importantly, correlated with in-game hitting performance. So it suggests that this inhibitory control that's, that's measured by the N2 might be an, a mechanism for how hitters can learn and enhance their, their game performance. Same thing with that medial frontal negativity. This proactive control was associated with greater response accuracy during our little task, correlated with you know, self-regulation, but also correlated with in-game hitting measures for these players, correlated with like real life stuff which is kind of rare for, for lab tasks. So the implications are that, that hitting is not just a pitch in a vacuum. From pitch to pitch, neural activity matters. How you process the feedback you get from umpires or coaches or yourself matters, and it can influence your motivation, your, your performance on the next pitch. And we can use these neural measures to, to index all kinds of psychological processes that people talk about anyway being confident and expecting to do well being motivated by the task paying attention to the pitch or to the strike zone and things like that but this is these are objective measures of these variables and this is data then for coaches and scouts and players to use that they don't have there's this huge data movement in baseball you know data and sabermetrics and measuring the physical well now in this case we can measure the mental. We can increase the efficiency of the mental side and coaching confidence and coaching expectations and kind of developing players. So in the future, I want to continue kind of examining these relationships with in-game measures because if it translates to the real world, that's kind of a big deal. I'd like to ideally look at players at different levels of expertise. We've had Wesleyan players. What about Division One players, say from ISU or U of I? What about minor league players or eventually even major league players to see if these relationships hold up or if they get stronger? Um, look at a player across time to see if there's anything predictive in here. Um, maybe change the paradigm a little bit. You can have different decisions, not ball strike, but, but pitch, you know, is it a fastball or a curveball? Or you can have, should I swing or take depending on the context? And then to do, to do any of this, I'd have to consult or partner with various teams or organizations to kind of get access to their players uh, because teams are pretty, 
pretty finicky about that. <laughs> but uh, that would be the goal is to get access to real players and see how, how broad this can be. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, Wesleyan for giving me the opportunity to do this research, uh, my students and colleagues for uh, helping me do all this research, my family and friends for putting up with me over the years, and, and all of you for giving up uh, your time today uh, to listen to me drone on about neural activity and baseball. And with that, I am done. So if, if anyone has any questions, comments, concerns, complaints, uh, please feel free to let me know. And I will, in theory, stop sharing my screen um, for the moment so I can see the chat. Great. Well, thank you, Jason. Appreciate it very, very much. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, questions for Jason? I'll just make uh, one uh, comment. Um, just last night on uh, PBS uh, stations, there were uh, two uh, video features that had to do uh, very closely related to this era of uh, research. And uh, the second one, uh, one hour, I think it might even be a series uh, produced by them. Uh, mm -hmm called uh, Hacking the Mind. Okay. And uh, you probably get more information than that in um, trade chat rooms or publications, but very interesting, the, the research today in, you know, how, how the mind works. It just uh, blows me away at my age, the progress that's been made. In this yeah, it, it's, it's, it's crazy what people can measure and how they can link things. I mean, the, the, the medical field has been the most predominant where now people that are maybe paralyzed, they can use brain activity to control artificial limbs and things like that. But now it's starting to bleed over into the performance and, and kind of world where you can kind of get into the mind and, and help performers, whether they be physicians or athletes or whomever, optimize their, their physical senses. And, and, and it's pretty fascinating. I haven't, um, I've been kind of in my own little baseball world lately, but looking at that and kind of taking ideas from other people and adapting it might be a good thing. So I appreciate that. Jason, we have a question from Maddie. Thank you. We have a question from Maddie Monk. I don't know mm -hmm. if you can see that. Yeah. Um, so how this data could be used to improve performance in, in baseball or softball would be it. Um, and I've, I've talked with some, some coaches and teams about this. It's, it's more, it gives you an anchor point. It gives you a data point. Whereas you can talk to a player and be like, hey, were you focused? Or, hey, did you? No, I, I was fine. I was, I was engaged. Well, here you can't fake the, the neural data. So we can have them doing something and we can see that for this player at this time, he or she wasn't, you know, wasn't showing as much attention maybe as his or her peers or has he or she had done in a previous time of doing this task. So it's, it's an actual data point. It's kind of like uh, what they've done with motion capture, where a hitter can say during a swing or a pitcher can say during a pitch, yeah, I'm flexing my wrist or yeah, I'm bending my elbow. And the motion capture tells a different story. And it gives you a talking point where now this is, this is real data that can't be fudged or you can't be misremembered or it can't be kind of massage, it's, 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 a, it's a good talking point. It gives you an objective measure of something you're already talking about. Uh, I've had a lot of coaches say, you know, some hitters, you know, they get mad if they miss a, like an umpire calls a ball a strike. And, and they're, then they're in their head and they're letting their emotions take over. And they're not thinking and they're not, you know, trying to learn and trying to adapt and be like, I'm not going to change the umpire's mind. I need to change my expectation. And so, so this is an anchor point, like, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of not paying attention to the feedback. You're more upset by that alarm bell going off that you were wrong. You're not doing what you can do to get ready for the next pitch or the next at bat. Other questions for Jason? Jason, uh, one question that I have is, have you reached out to other um, organizations or teams to see if you could replicate the uh, you know, even just going up the street to ISU, I think this would be kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I have, um, and they're they're pretty uh, not <laughs> they're, they're they're pretty non-responsive. I will say, uh, when this started, um, 
I actually had a collaboration with the old coach at ISU and he let me videotape his pitchers to get actual pitches. Uh, but he was let go and the new coaching staff, I reached out to them a couple times and I haven't heard anything back from them. Uh, people are very kind of pressed for time and, and kind of finicky with their time. So it's, it's something that they're not necessarily willing to do. You know, it's more valuable, you know, obviously to measure the physical or measure, you know, what you can do versus, uh, this kind of new slash different, you know, put someone in a cap and have them do a computer task kind of situation. But no, that, that, that is the, the, the current hurdle. Um, sending out emails and, and getting no responses or rejection responses to, to anyone I can find. Because, yeah, I mean, that's what ideally would be best. And yeah. I would adapt this. This could be adapted for softball. Um, it's just softball and baseball are different animals in terms of pitches. Like these are all baseball pitches. I haven't been able to find it for softball because softball is underhand, baseball is overhand. And so, but the same principles would apply. So that might be, if I keep a uh, really bad pun, striking out with the baseball teams, <laughs> maybe I could get, uh, develop this paradigm with softball pitches and then maybe reach out to, to softball teams. It's just, there's, um, there's greater infrastructure in, in baseball right now with, you know, professional leagues, minor leagues, there's more teams around than there are softball teams. Yeah. It would be interesting to see what would happen if you did. Uh, um, and I understand why some baseball teams might not want to do it, but um, mm -hmm. if you got say uh, some retired baseball players like a, a Cal Ripken jr. Who mm -hmm. obviously had a fairly successful career hitting the baseball, how he would do on this kind of a measure. So. Yeah, and it's interesting. You wonder how long it sticks with you, or does yeah. it does it go away with retirement age and things like that? Yeah, I mean, those are all questions I, I would like to to get at. I, I have currently been able to kind of partner with Wesleyan and kind of get access to players through Wesleyan. But yeah, expanding this would be would be scientifically very useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we uh, get done today? Jeff? Yes. Thanks again for taking time out for us today, uh, Jason. Yes, sir. That, that was incredibly fascinating, but at the same time, a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even play baseball, but yeah. And I was just kind of wondering about, too, uh, I think Carl touched on that a little bit, the relationships between the neural activity, say, for a pitcher um, when the bases are loaded. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, to see if you can regulate that and, just, and figure out what's going on in the person's head. So yeah, there's I mean, there's a there's a long history of of just it's not event related research, but it's EEG like the resting EEG. Different EEG patterns are associated with when you're relaxed or when you're nervous or when you're like agitated. And they've done they've been doing research for twenty or thirty years on say marksmen like sharpshooters, um, where they can control their mental activity to put themselves in a quiet, relaxed kind of state so that they're calmer, their body's calmer so they can shoot more accurately. Uh, so there's, there is research out there called biofeedback research where you can, and it's it just, it's another measure. It's like, you know, taking a deep breath or meditation, but you can kind of see its effects on your physiology by measuring not only your heart rate and your respiration and, and stuff like that, but also your brain activity. You can change your brain activity. So yeah, if a, a hitter's nervous because the bases are loaded or a pitcher's nervous because um, he or she's behind in the count and you can't walk this batter, like you should be able to measure that kind of resting change in agitation and nerves through EEG and see that pretty clearly. Yeah. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a Carl mentioned earlier uh, for the rest of you folks, and maybe it came in a little later, this is the 10th anniversary of the uh, Lunch and Learn, a collaboration between the Museum of History and Illinois Wesleyan University. So we invite you to join us next month where we're going to uh, uh, host uh, Illinois uh, State University Professor Emeritus Robert Bradley. And regardless of your political leanings, this is going to be a good one. Uh, the 2020 uh, election, and uh, we'll look at that and see uh, the history in the making. So with that, uh, we bid you a great day. Great. And, Thank uh, you, everyone. And I, hope oh, to I think there's one more question. Oh, something. Okay, yeah. Uh, just real quick, uh, it says, does your data imply that player hitting performance improvements can be learned 
or is there a predisposition to a certain player being good at seeing or responding? Uh, this all can be learned. This all is, is malleable, can be taught, can be, can be adjusted. So um, very famously in a series of studies, if, if I were to tell you to be as fast as you can versus be as accurate as you can, your pattern of neural activity looks completely different. So you can adjust all of this neural activity. There are obviously individual differences, where, but a lot of that can be an artifact of the measurement. But this is all improvable. This is all can be shaped, can be trained, can be learned, where a player who maybe um, does get very emotional when he's behind in the count or it's a bad situation can be, you know, can improve the, the kind of the mental side to pay better attention or focus on, you know, kind of the, the attention on the feedback versus the attention on emotion. So this can be um, trained and improved by, by changing psychological focus and attention. Okay. Sorry, I just saw that pop up. No, no, I'm glad you did. So yeah. thanks so much. Great question from the GOAT. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, without further ado, uh, I wish you all having a, a good afternoon, Jeff. And uh, uh, Jason, if you want to stick around for just a couple of seconds afterwards, that'd be sure. good. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Didn't even get a parking ticket. Hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>